Folks, welcome to the Work Item Podcast. And today I have a very special guest, none other than Jason Fried. Welcome, Jason. Hey, how are you? For folks listening to this, uh, you are probably heard about Basecamp. And if you haven't yet, you definitely should check out Basecamp and 37 Signals. I've been a big fan for a long time. And I wanted to ask the very, very first fundamental question is that you, you, you have a lot of unconventional approaches to work and specifically remote work and productivity, but what started it all? Where did you come up with kind of the ideas behind 37 signals and basically like what drove you to this? Yeah, probably a series of ex uh, experiences prior to that. Um, I remember having a few really bad jobs and a few really good jobs and mentally taking note of why they were good and why they were bad. And a lot of it had to do with the manager, you know, the person directly above me um, or the owner of the business. It wasn't the job itself. Like I, I could do whatever work needed to do. I didn't have any problem with the work. It was people I was working for. And I think that that, then I sort of created this matrix in my mind, probably of the kind of manager or owner I would want or want to be if I ever was one of those. And that's how it, how it is and how it was and how it is. And I've always kind of felt like, um, you know, I, I, entrepreneurs sometimes think they don't have a job. They have entrepreneurship, but they have a job. And the nice thing about being an entrepreneur is you get to create the job that you want to have. And so I've always tried to create the company I'd want to work at. And so all these ideas that we have are basically based on what seems reasonable to me and, and David, my co-founder, um, and hopefully reasonable to people who work here. And, um, you know, what's kind of interesting is that some are very non-conventional in our industry, but are quite conventional otherwise. Like we, we aim for profit. Pretty common thing in the world, but in our industry, it doesn't seem to be. So we're unconventional there, but actually quite mainstream in general. I think a lot of our ideas are kind of like that. So you took a risk. You started a company, and that's something that I think a lot of people have a lot of hesitation about, right? Because in the modern culture, there is kind of the, the camps of the startup, growth, hustle, let's work every day. And there is the camp of, you know what? I'd rather work for one of the, like, the big companies, the, the fangs or the, the mangas of the world, and then just kind of stick to that. You took a risk. What helped you kind of push yourself in that, in that environment? You know, it's funny because it, it didn't feel like a risk at the time because I was living out of my, I had like a one bedroom apartment, apartment in Chicago. And um, I was doing a little bit of freelance web design. Now you could say I already started the business if I'm doing freelance web design. So how'd that happen? Well, in college, I started doing freelance web design. I didn't really need the, the money to support myself, but I got interested in the thing. So I kind of got okay at it. And um, after college, I went and took a job somewhere actually in San Diego uh, working for some guys, a web designer. A few months in, I realized I wasn't really, didn't really like it. wasn't really built to do that, uh, to to work for someone else. I guess I went home, got an apartment, had a little bit of money saved up from from that job, and um, and from the money I was making in college while I was doing this website design stuff. And I just kept doing some freelance gigs, and I didn't have any other costs. You know, I had a laptop and. Um, uh, you know, computer, I mean, internet connection and, and an apartment. And as long as I could pay my rent and survive, I didn't have, you know, I was 21 or whatever. I, it, it just, it, it actually strangely felt riskier to me to go get a job. Um, I don't know why I just, so I just kind of kept doing the thing I was doing and able to pay my bills and save up some more and save up some more. And I just never got ahead of myself and that I never spent more money than I could afford to spend. I never took on debt that I couldn't afford to pay. Uh, I never bought something that I, I really shouldn't have bought. And I just was always just very practical and prudent about it. And in that, in that way, it just never seemed risky to me. I don't know. I, I think a lot of the risk people take on is they think when they think about starting a company that it's going to be a big company it, or, or they, they need to raise a bunch of money and hire a bunch of people and get an office and do branding exercises. And like that is, seems incredibly risky when you are starting out because it's like, expensive, time consuming. I got to get people. Where am I going to like, although I don't know how to do all these things, but meanwhile, I was just in this place where I was like, I can just keep doing what I'm doing out of my apartment and I'm comfortable with the work and that's all I need to do to support myself. And so I don't, I just eased into it, frankly. I know it's, it sounds like maybe a bit idyllic, but I think a lot of it does come down to not, um, not getting ahead of yourself and not biting off more than you can chew and just kind of going slow. And something that you're very well known is the culture and practices specifically around remote work, right? Because there's a lot of folks that start companies. There's just so many of them in the world that just go, nope, have to come to the office, 
have to be here eight hours. We have to have butts and seats. And if you're not here, then you might as well not work here. What led you down the path of, you know what? Remote work is actually viable and it is the future. Yeah, again, sort of just by accident. So um, I was working with with two other people in Chicago, or three actually, and then four. Um, and but we were all designers, and um, we didn't have any programmers on staff. And we and we kind of um, I was working on something on the side, and I needed a programmer to help me with it. Long story short, I posted something on the internet um, saying, "Hey, can anyone help me with this problem I have?" I kind of got far enough, but like kind of got stuck. And this guy named David Heinemeyer Hansen uh, emailed me out of nowhere. He lived in Denmark and I lived in Chicago. And he was incredibly helpful and we kind of hit it off and we started doing some work together on a couple of projects. And it just like never crossed my mind, excuse me, it never crossed my mind that there was something wrong with this, that he was in Denmark and I was in Chicago. Like we were both working, we were communicating clearly. We all had free time to do the work that we needed to do. We weren't, you know, in each other's faces. And it just worked. Um, it didn't even feel like remote work. It just like it, we were working, you know. Um, no different than if someone was down the street from me, but not in the same exact office. Even though they're local, we're working kind of not in front of each other and whatever. Like I, I and, and same thing is true when you work with clients. So you work with a client. The client's not sitting next to you. You're doing work for the client. The client's somewhere else, and they get back to you, and you go back and forth. And so, and then, and then our next employee happened to be a, a guy we hired out of Utah. And that worked out too. And then, so it just, like, it just kept, we kept basically saying, we're going to hire the best people we can find. I don't care where they are. And that's how it all started. So again, it wasn't this intimidating, do I, it it wasn't this like decision. Are we a local company? Are we a remote company? Do we have to make a decision? Do we have to decide right now? No, it's just like, let's find great people. Oh, this person happens to be here. This person happens to be here. This person happens to be here. We had great people in Chicago too. Let's just build a great company of great people cares where they are. And that's kind of how it all came together. What I also find interesting is that you've actually established this ground up culture of remote work, because if we've seen anything in the past three years is that a lot of companies were forced into remote work, but to mimic what you mentioned in kind of your, your 37 signal principles is they emulate the office, right? Like we still have an absurd amount of meetings and all these things that basically they shoved from the office back into your computer. How do you counter that? Like, how do you go just fully against the grain here? Yeah, I think because that doesn't really work very well. And I think we're seeing that now as companies are beginning to pull people back to the office, you know, and and they're saying like remote work doesn't work or whatever, 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 we're not productive enough. Well, I mean, remote work is way worse if you're trying to simulate the office from far away. It just is worse because if you're having the same number of meetings, but now they're happening over Zoom and you're staring into your laptop camera all day long and sitting still and not seeing other human beings. It's, just, it's kind of brutal uh, in a lot of ways. So we, we think remote work is just a different way to work. It's not just that you're not close to each other. It's literally a very different way to work. It's more asynchronous, less real time. So more publishing things, basically thinking about it in terms of publishing. I'm publishing a thought and we post them in Basecamp. People can post them wherever they want, whatever they use. Uh, and then you wait for people to get back to you. You don't stop everyone from doing what they're doing to have a conversation. Sometimes you do that. Very rarely though, do you do that. You Instead, write it up, post it up, and let people get back to you later on their own time. Very much like a lot of things work in this world. It could be it could be email. It could be even social media. A lot of these things that are not real time necessarily, they're just you throw a thought up there and whatever. So we do that a lot, and we don't have very many meetings, and we have a lot of people have a lot of autonomy, uh, and, and a lot of they're self directed, um, and they work in very small teams. And when you have very small teams, like a team of two, which is prim- our primary team size in, in most cases. If people need to talk, they'll hop on the phone or they can do a Zoom call, but that's not a meeting. It's just like two people having a conversation about something. So it might last eight minutes or, or 20 minutes or whatever, but it doesn't feel like a meeting. A meeting is like, let's pull a bunch of people off. Let's schedule it in the calendaring thing. We don't even have a calendar, a shared calendar at work. Like if I want to talk to someone or someone wants to talk to me, they just ping me through Basecamp and say, hey, are you free at like two o'clock? I'm like, uh, no, but how about four? Yeah, four works. Okay. So it's, everything's a conversation and you just have a conversation with one or two people. And that is very effective. So you still have the face-to-face when you need to and the real time when you need to, but it's not the primary way to communicate. And it doesn't have to be this big, huge deal about a meeting schedule and pulling people off their work and lining up schedules and dealing with time zones. It's just, it's so much easier when teams are really small. 
Are you taking also such extreme measures as your co-founder, David, in one of the latest uh, episodes of Rework, and we'll include links in the show notes as well, he talked about how he takes a window over the Zoom or whatever, the, the software that needs to happen so he doesn't see the face. Uh, are you applying similar practices to help yourself focus too and not feel like you're in a, in a meeting instead of a call with a person? That's interesting. I, I, I haven't done that, but most of the things I'm on are like, again, it's like one person. It's like, like we're talking. It'd be like this. We're just talking. It doesn't feel like a meeting. It's just we're, we're hashing something out. In this case, it's more of an interview style. But if you're working on a piece of work with someone else and you just need to like catch up with them for seven minutes, you just get it and you're done. Like when you have a phone call with a friend, you don't time it to a half hour, an hour. You just like, how long do we need to talk? And then we're done. We had our conversation. So I don't do the taping thing, face thing so much, but um, um, uh, I, I do only run one window at a time. So I, I work on a 13 inch MacBook. Uh, and, and I, I tend to not have, I don't, sometimes I do if I have to, but I tend not to have multiple windows open. So that helps me generally focus just on the thing I'm doing. And then I move on after that versus like, you know, a lot of people have a chat window, they'll use some chat tool and have a chat window up all the time or on a separate screen. And they're constantly like doing this because they're working and then they see a red dot over here and they have to look over here. That's horrible. It's a horrible way to work. I think it's very unproductive and, and frustrating and, and disruptive and, so just one thing at a time. And if I'm ready, if I feel like I want to check my email, like I'll go check my email separately. I'll go like stop doing what I'm doing and go check it. Um, and I only do that a few times a day versus like constantly bouncing back and forth. I don't have any notifications on anywhere. I just, I want to be, it's funny. Notifications are called push notifications, but really they're pull. They pull you into the thing. So I don't want to be pulled into anything. So I turn them off and I check things when I need to, unless it's an emergency. And in that case, someone will call me on the phone and that's a different level. I like that because it's a very refreshing approach to basically prioritizing your own time for your own work instead of letting others effectively drive your to-do list of things you need to do. Well, you can just ask people who use shared calendars, how many of those things that are on their calendar were put there by them and how many are put there by other people or initiated by others. Most people would say most of the stuff on my calendar, which is your time, is taken by others. Uh, or directed by others. And and he and some people might say, I've heard this, this argument, well, you own the place, you can do whatever you want. No, you know, this is the rule for everybody. Everybody has a full eight hour day to themselves at, at, at 37 Signals. People have obligations to each other. They may have to jump, jump on a call or whatever, but it's a small team, whatever. But you have an eight hour day to yourself. The company is not taking your time away. There's no scheduled anything for the company. Um, it's just you you do your work on your own time, your own way, and uh, everyone has the same uh, situation that I do in that case. And I mean, you've talked about this on multiple occasions that meetings are toxic and that this is one of those things that it just sucks up the energy, it sucks up the time. And how many times people get out of a meeting and then think like, what exactly was decided here? Yeah. Why did we even talk about this stuff? Yeah, they often, um, you know, meetings sort of beget meetings and give birth to new meetings. And, and that's kind of what happens. Um. It's, it's a cultural thing though. It was like, what happens is, is the meetings are the only places you make decisions. That's what ends up happening. And when that's the case, companies have a lot of decisions to make. So they, they like tend to just have to have meetings because that's the medium in which they make decisions. It's the moment which we're making decisions all the time. Individuals are making decisions. A lot of people have a lot of control over their own work and how they're going to get it done. And they're making decisions as they go. We don't need to, to um, make these, these decision moments moments in time where people need to stop what they're doing and gather around to hear the decision um, or even contemplate the decision. Like you can contemplate the decision on your own time. Someone's responsible for making it. When they make it, they announce it in Basecamp by posting a message or whatever, or telling the one or two or three people who need to know, and that's it. And everyone else is left alone. And it's, it's just, it's a much more peaceful way to work. And you can get, you can make a ton of progress with very small teams when you have a full eight hour day to, to, to yourself. That's it. It doesn't, that's a lot of time. And frankly, no one's really working eight hours anyway. Like if you have a good four or five hours a day, like you're really way ahead of the curve, frankly. So, you know, that's enough time. I find it also funny that the counter to that argument is usually like, well, if we don't have a meeting, then we'll have to go back and forth and back and forth in this document for hours and days on end. Can we just get on a call and hash it out and just be done with it? How do you make decisions in your case? There are times when when um, when a call is is a faster way to do it, um, but you just kind of have to think of the costs. So if you keep pulling people off what they're doing to have a call, like that's very costly. No wonder you can't get anything else done. People are constantly not working. They're 
part of other things they don't really need to be part of. So yeah, we tend to deliberate could be over days and sometimes it's just minutes. Um, but we, you know, if it's a, if it's a big decision, we, we post it up, we write it up. Everything's written up first. So like, I'm, I'm sorry, my hands aren't totally in the screen. It's like a, a doc, a long form document, like a whole document, you know, a, a page or two, let's call it a page or two. Um, but it's, it's a, it's a thoughtful, um, pitch that's put together by someone who knows how to write, um, and, and make their point. And, um, and then we, we get to read it and absorb it. They took time to write it. You should have time to think about it. This idea that like someone can have all this time to prepare something and then you're in a meeting and you have to respond, like it's unfair. There's, it's, it's, it's not even, it doesn't, it's not good. It's just like, let people think about it. Let people observe. So we'll have a little comment thread that might go over a day or two, perhaps different people chiming at different times. And then we'll make a call and we'll make a decision. Other times there's like something that's truly, truly urgent or whatever. That's a different story, but most things are not. Most things can, can, can not only wait, but develop. And, 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 and I think when you span a day or two on something, like you get a good night's sleep, people have a new point of view in the morning. These are very healthy things. Sometimes things tend to go on and on that way. That can be a, a downside. When that happens, you spot it. You go, we got to make a call right now, or we got to make a call by the end of the day, or let's just make a call, whatever it is. But, but to, to, to find one example where that happens and go, oh, this is how it always happens. Like it doesn't always happen that way. Most decisions are totally fine, strung out over a day or two. Um, a deliberation discussion back and forth, and it's pretty clear what the, what the outcome should be. And that's, that's how we make it. And the approach you kind of alluded to is that ASAP is rarely ASAP. And that is oftentimes stuff that people ask of you is not that urgent. It's not, it's a very few things should actually be urgent. And if, if everything's urgent, there's a much deeper problem. Um, things tend to get urgent at the end of deadlines or things tend to be urgent. Uh, because someone changes their mind or like you got to look at these things and go why, why is everything so urgent like wh what why are we so poor at managing our time and why does everything get piled up at the end and like these are these are moments of of, of growth and and learning and figuring out like th this isn't shouldn't be normal shouldn't be normal um now some people use the word urgent or asap or some priority thing to um shove their um perspective or sh shove their needs ahead of others and sometimes that is important if there's a, a security issue. Okay, right, obviously. But companies need to be very careful when everything's uh, urgent in ASAP. So um, we're just super careful about that. And oftentimes if something was to come up on a Saturday, for example, and I happen to check something and someone's asking me a question or whatever, it's, this can wait till Monday morning. Just you have to remind people in the company that it can wait. It can wait. Like we just had a thing that a, a, a practical real example, um, we're launching um, special pricing for the Indian market. So we have a lot of customers in India, um, but a lot of customers write us and they go, we just can't afford it because the, the currency conversion is difficult and it's very expensive for us here and totally get it. So we're launching, um, in fact, today, maybe announce it tomorrow, but uh, it's up now, basecamp.com slash India, a special price for, for customers in India. And we were trying to kind of nail down some copy on, on the on the page on Friday and didn't quite get it done. And there was a little bit of chatter over the weekend. And and I'm just like, look, we can wait till Monday. This can wait till Monday. Like there should it shouldn't happen over the weekend. It doesn't need to happen over the weekend. We're not launching it over the weekend anyway. It can happen Monday. So whenever we see moments like that, we gotta like stop them early so they don't get out of hand. And it all starts with you as a leader basically setting the example there, because I think that's a perpetual challenge that, you know, it sounds like one of those areas that your manager, your manager's manager and levels above them, people need to instill that culture because I'm struggling a little bit to fully kind of push that change bottoms up, right? Like if your entire team says, hey, we're going to have meetings, we're going to do this on a Saturday, and you're the only person that's like, Hey folks, how about we do this in writing? Uh, you're gonna get shoved aside. Yeah, very, very hard. It's true. Um, it is a it is a uh, top down change. It, it is a um, an emphasis of uh, you know emphasizing calm, emphasizing um, uh, you know re regular work hours. Because yeah, you're right. It, it's very hard. I mean, sometimes on the team level, if you have a, a team that all agrees and you have a small team, you can kind of have your own society and your own rules to some degree. But but it is hard when someone above you is expecting something out of you that that conflicts with the way you want to do things. So it really it's very hard to work in a place where 
the, 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 the CEO or the boss or the manager or the team leader, whatever, is just like screaming down your throat, you know, like, I need this, I need this, I need this. I don't care if it's Saturday, whatever. You can't be like, hey, man, what if, can we wait till Monday? Like, it's going to be very hard, like practically to do that. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think the, the major changes here need to happen up, up top um, and they need to create basically an umbrella to protect people's time and attention. Uh, and that's sort of what my job, I feel like one of my primary jobs is, is to create, I'm sorry, to protect people's time and attention. With the principles that you've established with Shape Up, there is, I mean, quite a few of them. And again, for folks that are not aware, go to 37signals.com and you can read more about them. But they're very, reading through them, very reasonable list. Yes, like agreeing to everything. How long did it take you to kind of establish the set? And are they basically kind of the, the, the commandments of your company or do they have flex in them and they evolve over time? Yeah, so Shape Up, uh, which is the way we work on, uh, work on projects, um, across the company. It's, it's sort of our methodology. Some people might follow agile methodology or waterfall or we're, we have this thing called shape up. Um, this is sort of a, it evolved over the last 20 years and it continues to evolve. Um, and we just sort of put a book together, um, you know, uh, recently in a website. Um, so people can, can see this and read this and it's free to check out and it's at basecamp.com slash shape up for the actual book and, and the website. Um, this is a culmination of, of attempts, of, of explorations, of, 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 of um, things we've tried and different lengths of time, different approaches. And this is sort of where we're at right now for the most part. And it is flexible. Um, that, a big part of this is human judgment is, is a huge part of this. Uh, it has to be. Um, there are principles, there are guidelines, there, there are approaches that we, we espouse and believe in and, and think work really well. But in any given situation, it's always context over consistency. Um, so we just want to make sure that we're not being dogmatic about some of these things because that's not a good place to be either. But you also have to, you, everything can't be super flexible all the time. Then you don't have anything. So there, there's, you know, there, there, there are these, these rails essentially that we're on. And, and, and you know, sometimes you got to get off, off the train, do a little bit differently because it's just different. Um, so we, we expect... Excuse me, we expect people to have um, to, to use their to bring and use their good judgment in every situation, and, and that's sort of another fundamental component to it. Given the evolution of where it is today, any memorable examples when things did not work as you expected them, and you had to shift them? Oh yeah, I mean this this happens, uh, still happens from time to time. Like something goes too long, so we, we say we we give things six weeks max, basically, and there's sometimes occasionally something might go a little long, might go a week or two, and that kind of th screws everything up. But like it's, in we felt, feel like it's incredibly important to get it done. So you have to make an exception there. You really try to almost never make exceptions there because um, scheduling specifically is really complicated because if, 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 you, if you throw off one cycle, it throws off the rest of the year, people aren't available. It's, it, it's really, so we only do that in very rare occasions, but we have done that in occasions where we shouldn't have done it. And we've done it, we haven't done it on occasions when we should have done it. So like, that's one thing that's very, very hard. And you still have to kind of work hard at that. Um, there's been moments where we, I think had too many, we, we're now a two people team or two person teams. We used to have three person teams and we've shifted away from three and down to two. So one programmer, one designer. Um, and I think every time we've given, we put more people on a project, it really doesn't help it. Um, and so we have had to learn our lesson a few times there. Um, there's, there's a number of things. And, uh, you know, sometimes we bring in QA too late. Sometimes we don't bring QA in. Sometimes we bring QA in too early. Sometimes we over QA things like these are learnings as well, but it, it's not, and we don't, a lot of companies have these postmortems, you know, uh, we sometimes do, but very rarely, actually, I, I, I don't feel like you learn a whole lot, frankly, from looking back at what you think went wrong. Um, I think your best go, we, we kind of know that didn't work out well. Let's just like move forward and do what we know works and get back to where we're supposed to be. And a lot of things will ultimately self-correct that way. So I think that's a little bit more our, our approach to things as well. What the trend of this conversation for folks listening, if you haven't kind of <laughs> fully realized is that Jason, you and your company are defying quite a few of the quote unquote industry best practices, like things that people think that should be followed all the time. And this is, you know, if you're starting a startup, you need VC funding, you need always growth up and to the right on every single chart. 
And you're kind of taking a very level-headed approach of saying, you know what? We can do this at our own pace. We can do this in a way that's sustainable for our people, for our company. And you focus on what you refer to as the Fortune 5 million instead of the Fortune 500. Now, given that, what helps you ground yourself in it, right? Because again, for somebody that thinks about you know startups or companies, it's always like, well, where am I going to get the money? How am I going to make this sh- make sure that I outcompete my competitors? And there's a lot of competitors out there. Arguably, like Basecamp has a lot of competitors too, and yet you're successful. You're you're doing really well. Well, so everyone has competitors, and there's always competitors, and you can't do anything about them. So I think like we don't pay that much attention to that because you can hit your head, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, you can keep hitting your head and like, why can't I figure this out? And what are we going to do? They're doing this, and we're doing that, and you just like, yeah, they're going to do what they're going to do. The only thing that really matters, I think, when it comes to competition is that you compete against your own costs. So if if you want to stay in business, you've got to make more money than you spend. That's the real competition. Now, you someone would say, well, you have to get customers and they're and they're choosing between millions of different products or tens of different products, whatever, right? That's true too. That's true too. But how many do you need is up to you. So for example, um, Google might need uh a million, two million, five million, ten. Facebook's a good example. Facebook just announced that with, with threads, like, like we, we, if something does get to a billion users, it's not interesting to us. That's like basically the scale that they're at. Like, if, if I get fifty thousand paying customers on Hey, I'm a happy camper. Hey's our email service for those who don't know, hey.com. So like fifty thousand. But let's say Facebook was in the email business and they only got fifty thousand paying subscribers, they would kill that product in a week because. To them, that doesn't work. It doesn't work with their scale. It doesn't work with their costs. Our costs, it works beautifully. You know, we have a small company. We have high margins. Like we can make that work. So you really compete with your own business model and your own business first. And the number of customers you need is up to you. It's not up to them. And there's going to be many cust- many competitors that you have that can have more customers, more revenue. You can go broke having more revenue. You can go broke having more customers if your profits, if you don't have the profits. So we're focused on that. So I don't know, that, that's my feeling about competition is to really pay attention to your own business um, and, and not look too much. So, so my, my way of thinking is like more heads down and less looking around, basically. Get your own stuff right. Yeah, th- this is the part that a lot of startups I think miss because there's this understanding of like, if we don't make more money over time, more and more and more and more, then we're dead in the water. Well, there's a sense that you have to keep growing, otherwise you're dying. And like, I, I understand some of that. Um, that's true. But but also like dying of what? So if you're, let's let's say you're, let's say you're the, the, a local restaurant, a local Italian restaurant, and you've been in business for 50 years, okay? And, um, you know, you're not growing. You only have 24 tables and you basically kind of fill them up and nor you don't or whatever, but it's kind of been the same steady business. And it's put kids through college and it's allowed the, the owners to have, you know, a, a retirement. Like who would look at that and go, they're, they're not successful. Like I would look at that and go, man, they've bucked all the odds. They're a business that's been in business for 50 years. Um, they're not growing, but they don't need to grow. They just need to sustain. Uh, that's wonderful. And most businesses are like that. This idea of like perpetual growth is, is very much a, it's a tech thing. It's a VC led thing. I don't think you, you obviously don't want to shrink. If, if that restaurant was booking 24 tables a night and then 22 and then the next year 16 and then four, you've got a problem at some point, but also maybe it's okay for a while. Like things come and go. Even, even major companies, they lose billions of dollars some quarters and other quarters. They, like It's about the long-term trend. Are you able to sustain enough to stay in business? That is success. Staying in business is success in any form. Growth does not equal success. I know lots of companies, our direct competitors, for example, that grow revenues and are losing hundreds of millions of dollars a quarter, have never made a single penny. I don't want to be in their shoes. I would never trade positions with them ever, even though their revenues are significantly higher than ours. I don't, that's not healthy growth. That's just growth. So that's how we look at it, you know? Yeah. And a lot of them probably assume that, you know, if we're growing, like at some point the users will pay, right? Like if only we can get more users, we're going to throw all the money into ads, into visibility. Like your example, again, from Rework was like, there's like airport ads, right? Like you, you fly into SFO and there's all these ads of like productivity suffering. It's like, if only we can put more money and more eyeballs on this, our product is going to be successful because they'll pay eventually, right? Yeah. 
Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. And the problem is, is that all the, all the while you're amassing more and more and more costs. You're hiring more and more people and you're making it harder and harder and harder for your business to actually uh, enter the black, uh, to, to, get, to get to profitability or break even or whatever, right? Um, it's very hard when you keep growing because it's not just like you're not just growing spending. You're growing your, all the mass that has to hold up the whole thing. So we, we've intentionally stayed relatively small. We're the biggest we've ever been. We're about 80 people now, which is the biggest we've, we've ever been. But um, as long as we make a lot more money than we spend, we are, in our minds, successful. And I don't really care. And I, I hope other companies are successful. Like I, I don't, what I'm saying is I don't care how much more successful someone else is. It, do, it doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with me. I wish them well. I wish them well. I hope, I hope a lot of people do really well. They should. It's a lot of work that goes into this stuff. A lot of people putting their careers into building things that you hope stick around. Um, but all we can worry about is, is, is our own fundamentals of our business and making sure we take care of our customers and our employees and all that. And even if, let's say we stood still for the next 20 years or even lost a few percentage a year or something, and we lasted 20 more years or 25 more years or whatever it might be, like that's great too. That's fine. You know, it's fine. All these things are fine as long as you're making more money than you spend on any given year. And by any measure, I think like Basecamp is a wonderful product. Hey is a wonderful product. Like it, it's the team has done an amazing job putting it together. So you're not sacrificing product quality no. by doing this, right? Like if somebody would look and say like, should I use Basecamp? The answer is like, yeah, look, it's a fully featured suit of tools. It's not something that's like half baked or you're trying to struggle to keep it afloat. Like it's very well a great product. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You don't need this thing. Like most of these companies that are quite large, a big part of it is, is sales and marketing and it's, it's the product. It doesn't take many people to build a great product. It takes really good people to build a good product, but it doesn't take many of them. Now, different products are different. Like I'm not, we're not making hardware. We're not making cars. You know, I'm talking software. I'm talking business software. Most of it is quite straightforward. And a lot of it is about the user experience and really coming up with the ideas that make sense to, that fit into people's lives and help their workflows improve. But you don't need a whole lot of people to do that. You just don't. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's being small does not sacrifice quality at all. In fact, I, I find it to be much higher quality because people are more, you're, you're closer to the product, you're closer to the customers, you really hear from people, you really know what works and what doesn't. And I think in most cases, small businesses care more. They just do, they like, it's just inherent in a small business. You, you have to care more. And then you have a forcing function for prioritization because you don't have to say yes to every single feature request because like, oh, all, all these people are going to tackle it eventually. We have, we have this huge sales force and everything else. Right. Like, yeah. We, yeah. Right. Like we have enough to do everything. Well, we don't, and no one does, of course, but we certainly don't, you know? Um, so what matters, what really matters, what can really improve the product, what's really worth doing. These are really good questions to ask. And uh, I think they, they end up uh, leading to a much better product. So Jason, this has been a wonderful conversation and I want to wrap up by asking one question that I ask of all the guests. And that is, if you think of like an unconventional piece of advice that somebody's listening to this and say, you know what, I want to follow in Jason's footsteps. I want to do that. What would you say to them? Well, I would say start small, start slow and, and don't rush. Uh, keep, you know, don't spend more than, 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 than you can afford. Um, don't put yourself in a position where you're, where you're behind. Um, and a lot of things, like there's a lot of things we just can't do that we wish we could do that we just can't do. Um, and you have to get used to that and have to get comfortable with that. Um, so I, th I think uh, a big part of it is, is to some degree curbing a bit of your ambition, um, and, and saying, you know, I can get to these other things if we stick around, like that's a beautiful, th beautiful thing about pro uh, profit. If you're profitable, you get to stick around another year. And there's a lot of things you're going to want to do in your career or in your business. And the best way to get a chance to do as many as you can is to be profitable. If you go out of business in year three, I don't care how big your, your eyes were and how big your ambitions were, you don't get to do the things you wanted to do. Um, this is one of the real reasons to be profitable and to not take a bunch of outside money and be beholden to someone else's time frame and someone else's expectations. Um, if you have a, a lot of stuff you want to do in your career, get profitable and buy yourself the time to do those things. Love it. Jason, where can people find you online? I'm on uh, LinkedIn, Jason Freed, F-R-I-E-D, Twitter, Jason Freed. Uh, I just joined Threads. I don't know if I'll stick around there, but um, I think I'm jsn.frd there. But, but I'm not really using that much. I would say the other place is um, I have a newsletter. So it's world.hey.com slash Jason. Uh, I write 
don't know, a couple times a week, maybe at, at most. Um, that's another place. And then, and then check out, you know, our blog, I'm sorry, our, uh, our, our website, 37 signals, Basecamp, and Hey.com. And also, as you mentioned, we have a, a podcast rework, um, the rework podcast, which you should check out in, in your podcast reader. We, we put an episode out once a week. And we'll put every one of them in the show notes because they're all wonderful resources. And Jason, thank you so much for sharing your insights and being with us today. That was fun. Thanks for having me on.